and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 164. Today we're going to be talking, we're going to be looking at a couple of images that have been sent in, well three images in fact, um, for feedback and critique, so we'll be looking at those. So if you're looking to improve your understanding of photography, you're in the right place. Uh, make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit the little notification bell so you know of future episodes. We are currently here live on Instagram, so if you happen to be watching along live, then leave a comment. Uh, let me know where you are. Let me know what the weather's doing. Um, if you happen to be watching the recording, then uh, that's fine too. You have uh, more difficult to leave a live comment. <laughs> but if anything really uh, grabs your interest, then still leave a comment anyway um, in, in the box. But uh, yeah, make sure you subscribe to all that kind of stuff. So yes, hello and welcome. We are, yes, I will, a little bit of warning straight away that I am suffering from an extreme bout of sciatica. I have been for the last few days and it's been pain at a level that you just can't escape from. It's quite been quite horrible. Now I'm currently dosed up with a bunch of painkillers um, and I've been resting on my side for the last hour in the hope that, and that which helps ease off the pain. Currently, I'm at manageable levels. If this suddenly becomes too painful, I may end up having to call a stop to uh, stop early on the podcast. At the moment, I'm OK, um, but just to give you that kind of slight warning ahead. Meanwhile, I see we have people in commenting already. Uh, Robert says, howdy all from a hot and dry Texas. Susan says, hi from yet another wet day in Kakubri. Now, that's interesting because Kakubri is nine miles down the road. And yet here we are in Castle Douglas haven't had a drop of rain yet. It was raining overnight, but it's actually been dry all all day. Um, threatening on occasions, and some grey clouds out there at the moment, but there's still actually a bit of sunshine. So even though we only live nine miles away, there's quite often a diff weather difference here between here and Kakubri. Noticed that before. Uh, Maggie says, uh, sunny here in Castle Douglas. Oh, of course, <laughs> but I see grey clouds gathering. Yeah, she's gone on to say exactly what I have. Uh, Meg says, hello, everyone. John says, hello from Columbus, Ohio. Been busy doing photo shoots lately. Excellent. I look forward to seeing what you've been up to then, John. Make sure you put one or two in uh, for some feedback. Uh, Nadia says, hi from Fife. Welcome back, Nadia. Uh, Rosemary says, good morning. It's so good to be back after several Sundays of travel. I hope everyone is doing well. Good to see you again, Rosemary. I've been kind of missing your live comments. Uh, Sandra says, hello, everyone from a rainy Birmingham. Uh, April says, hello, everyone from a sunny and warm day in Long Island, New York. Um, and the Northeast has been getting much more rain this summer. Uh, more above us, though. May and June was bad till last week. All right. Um, yes, Susan says, we have our own microclimate in Kakubri. Oh, and April and Sandra are both uh, saying um, hope comments about my back um, and uh, April also say uh, well yeah okay now April's chatting away to uh, Rosemary so <laughs> okay that's that's great I mean chat among yourselves as well um, get the conversation going this is this is I I've, oh, I've been doing this for nearly three and a half years now and I I love the community side of this there's a great great group of people who turn are you you who are here especially you are sitting alive and joining in the comments absolutely wonderful um, give yourselves a have, a have yourselves a smug moment for for your commitment to coming back each week. Um, right, okay. So what are we going to do? So yes, today then is all about um, critique and feedback. So I've had three people send in. Uh, Margaret, uh, Amajit, and Robert have all sent me in images for a little bit of feedback. So I think we'd probably better make a start as long as for as long as my kind of back and leg hold out. Um, so what I think we will do is we'll start with Margaret. Now, um, Margaret sent in this photo here and she said, I love taking photos of the Devagilla Bridge on different days, different weathers. It's a favourite spot of mine lately. Any feedback would be appreciated. Thank you. So if you happen to know um, Dumfries, uh, it's the kind of main market town about 20 miles down the road from here. Uh, then you would very quickly recognise this bridge. Uh, so one of the main features going across the river, Nith. And you always get that kind of flat still bit before there's a weir then and the water starts running over the top of it. And um, so occasionally you get a heron sitting around there as well. Uh, but it's, it's quite a kind of nice, it's a popular place to either sort of sit and eat your sandwiches looking over or just lean against the railings and sort of stare and listen to the water as it uh, goes tumbling by quite often. Now, um, 
Margaret did put in, she said, well, I mean, she, she put the picture up and then hadn't really said anything about it. So I asked her and then she, um, a bit more, but she, all she's really said is, it's a favourite spot of mine, any feedback would be appreciated. Um, the tricky thing here is, Margaret, and it's one of those things that I say quite often, is that if you don't give me any real sense of what kind of feedback you're looking for, it's very difficult for me to... Um, help you at you see what i don't know what i don't understand i don't necessarily know is the stage you're at with your photography and so therefore what you're needing to what you're needing help with and what would make a difference so if you're so if we take this bridge for example you want to take a photo of the bridge you have a photo of the bridge the bridge is in focus the horizon is straight there, you've not got any blown highlights, you've not got anything lost in the shadows. Technically, it's all there. You want a photo of the bridge, you have the photo of the bridge. Anybody from Dumfries or anybody who's been to Dumfries would recognise the bridge. So, if that's what you set out to do, box ticked, you've done it. Next up, though, comes the point of what else might you have done? And that then depends on your level of photography because not everybody's coming at it from the same starting point some people want to know what they might have done about the light some people might want to know about different kinds of composition or different kinds of narrative things that could be going on with the photo now the thing about this bridge is that there's lots of different angles you could take it from this one gives you more or less the full length of the bridge, um, certainly from this point here. And you do, in fact, just clip in the other end and there's the tree in the way. But you can just as easily, and I've seen plenty of times, people taking photos, say, from the, the top end of the bridge over here, looking along the length of the bridge. And then you actually have um, Dumfries, some of the buildings of Dumfries sitting over on, you know, off in on the direction on the right. Um, if you are down by the water's edge here, you can shoot along the length of the bridge and you can get a different kind of sense of what you don't necessarily get here. But anybody who's been to the bridge knows is you have these bits here, which are quite triangular as they kind of come out. They sort of jut out into the water, uh, which you can't really tell from this angle. But if you're further down, you look along and you can see all these bits come out. And so you change changes the texture of the bridge it changes the shape of the bridge um, there are even um, there's things like uh, the little lamp post which is uh, which is quite nice and if you were to go there in the evening so during the blue hour so the blue hour is just after the sun has set but before it's got completely dark but then what tends to happen is the street lights come on but there's still a bit of color in the sky and if you've got that and you've got some of the lights on so then you actually end up with the light in the lamp that and you're at a particular angle that becomes an interesting time to do it as well. Depending on the time of day you're at, now what you're doing here, this river runs more or less north-south. So the sun is never really going to be in the sky at this point, but depending on the weather, there could you could have some really beautiful, colorful skies there um, if you're there either early in the morning or late at night. So the thing is, is that actually it's kind of difficult for me to know what kind of advice to give you because you're not really asking me what kind of advice you're after. Um, if you want an in focus picture that shows that it's the bridge, you've achieved it. If you're wanting to know what else you could do with it, then there's all these different angles and then there's all these different times of day. And but then you also say it's um, you. Uh, you love taking photos of the bridge on different days and in different weathers. So I suspect you're already aware of that. Um, if you were wanting to take this, this picture beyond the idea of it being in focus and identifiable, if you're wanting to lift it to another level, then that really comes down to quite often it's the angle you're at. But even if you were taking it from this angle, it's about the light. The light and the shadow is what's going to make all the difference. Here it's a very dull day. It's overcast. There's no real interesting shadows. There's no real interesting light. So if you were there around sunset just before or just after, um, if you were at slightly different angles, if there happened to be a heron in the foreground, if there were, you know, these other elements that then add and make a, a picture more interesting. So 
not a lot more I can really say about that with this one, Margaret, um, other than really try, try different weathers, try different light, try different angles and see what you come up with. And then if you find that you, if you ever get to a point where you feel you're close, but then you're, but you're not really sure, you're missing something, then send that picture in as well. And then let, but give me the feedback. Tell me what your sticking points are. And at that point, I'll be able to give you much more um, targeted help, I think, um, so that you can get a much better understanding of how to just make something work um, when you're struggling with it a bit. So, I hope that, sorry I can't give you more than that, but I hope that gives you an idea. And for everybody else watching, it is, um, it is this sort of sense of uh, the feedback, these feedback sessions work on the idea of you sending me images, but you letting me know what kind of feedback you're after. Um, too often, there's a sort of sense of, here's a photo, tell me what you think. But tell you what I think under what context. You know, tell you what I think about the light, tell you what I think about the composition, tell you what I think about whether it would do well in a photo crowd competition, tell me what I think about whether it would do well in a camera club competition, or um, one of these sort of top kind of global competitions uh, where there's prize monies of, you know, two or five or ten thousand pounds. Because each of these different kind of competitions, each of these different places where you might display that photo will have different sets of criteria by which they measure things. So one photo which might do quite well in one context might do terribly in another context. Um, we've all had experience of this. So this is why it becomes very important to be able to let me know the context of the photo, where it's gonna be shown and what your sticking points are because at that point then I'll be able to give you the best help. Right, a uh, couple more comments. Um, uh, April says, I like solid water to the rapid water uh, water look. Um, Rosemary says, would a cinematic crop minus the white water help? Oh, well, I think, I think really what happens then is that draws it more down to the bridge. But as the bridge is sort of in a fairly dull light, just from one particular angle, you can see it's a bridge. I don't know all that actually happens at that point is you remove other elements, which I think might be slightly more interesting. Um, and... April's then also asking about the idea of cropping the photo on the left or the right. And I think these will maybe sort of just make small adjustments, but I don't know that they're really ultimately going to make a huge amount of adjustment, a change to the photo, not a significant change. Um, in the end, you're still looking at the bridge more or less, not exactly flat on, but very close to flat on. And the question is really, is how do you make it a more interesting photo of the bridge? And for this, you kind of need other elements. And those other elements could be the light or the sky, or it might be a heron, or it might be an otter, or it might be, or it might be people walking across it, or people walking across carrying flags, or any number of other things that might actually be sort of adding to it. Actually cutting out what's, what's already there, cutting out a bit to the left or the right, or the top or the bottom, I don't think is necessarily going to add anything more to it than that. Um, right, okay, so, uh, well, Nadi has also said about the idea of cropping to the right as well. Um, okay, well, look, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's just bring that photo back up because everybody wants to know what it would look like if it was cropped to the right. So let's open, let's just quickly open this with Photoshop and run around a couple of different potential crops. So you see, if we take, so we've got the picture here. Now, if we crop off, how far do we take out the left? Do we take out the pavement, the tree, the, uh, or the, take out the railings? Still got a bit of tree there. Now at this point, it's starting to become a bit unbalanced. So maybe then we take out this side here. And then at this point, it's starting to, so we, we come down here and then we, but then, well, maybe April was talking about removing the, the bit in the foreground and we do something like that. And as you can see, fine, we have the bridge, but I don't know that there's anything much more to it than that. Um, if you're starting to look at the idea we're getting these sort of circular reflections, which are maybe slightly interesting, the problem is, is that the balance now isn't right. Um, to, to get the reflections, we need a bit of space, which we can't get because of the water here. 
So you either make a feature of the water or you have to move to a different space. Now, maybe if you were trying to make a feature of the reflections, you would kind of zoom in and sort of crop in somewhere around here. But then that's, yeah, I think there's other places you would have to kind of move over the bridge and backwards and forwards to try and probably actually taking the photo from the opposite bank where you don't have the weir running across, but you've got much more flat water in front of you would allow you to make more of the reflections. But those are the only extra bits that are particularly interesting in this. And certainly if we get to a point whereby we crop out the whole tree, well, then we've lost most of the bridge. So we end up having to crop into the edge of the bridge. And again, at this point, all that's happened really, I feel, is that we've lost rather than gained. Um, we've now got a bridge, but we don't have a context for the bridge, at least in the original setting, there's a little bit more of a context to it. So hope that makes sense uh, to everyone watching, but you're right, it's always worth playing around with the crop just to see whether it's going to uh, make a difference or not. Um, right, okay, oh, Pat's joined us as well. Um, excellent. Right, okay, so let's move on then. And um, what I will do is I will move to Robert. So Robert sent in this photo and said, I know the subject is slightly out of focus and was underexposed. <laughs> <laughs> Good start. I didn't have much. Ch I didn't have a chance to, to change the settings when he looked at me and gave the thumbs up. I need to make this black and white for state Texas State Fair and would love your input. Now, rather wonderfully, as Robert usually does, Robert has sent me the original photo so we can see what he means um, by compa comparing. So let's uh, just open this up. And here we can see, yes, it's underexposed. And if we zoom in, can't really see so much here, a bit difficult, but if I just pull the exposure up, then yes, what I can see here is that the, the microphone is beautifully sharp and the eyes are just not quite there. And so what's happened here then is now your settings, ISO 50, 50 millimeter lens and F 1.2, 400th of a second, right? And that F 1.2, that's really kind of where your problem comes. Now, Absolutely, you're at a point, somebody's sticking his thumbs up, you can't go, hold your hand there, mate, because I've just got to, while I adjust and give myself an, an F7, so that I can make sure that your thumb, your face, and the microphone are all in focus. You're right, you've just got to kind of grab it while you can. He's eyed you, he's giving you a thumbs up. If you don't go click there, you've missed the potential shot. However, the auto, or your auto focus, has noticed that there's as well as sort of the fact that generally speaking, it will try, well, where are we going? There we go. It will generally kind of tend to highlight the face. Sorry, I'm just, right, there we go. Um, there's a strong contrast between the microphone and the face. So we've got a light patch here and a dark patch here, right kind of in the middle of where the face is. So part of the auto settings on your camera when it's trying to lock on to something, especially if you've got eye, um, uh, eye detection or something like that. Eye detection works from the fact that the eye, I mean, if we zoom in even closer here, then the eye has, the eye is a darker part up against the lighter part. So it's that contrast between light and dark that helps the camera know where to lock onto. Now, when, because the original photo is so far away, it doesn't usually get much, it can't lock onto the eye as such, but suddenly it's noticed here's a contrast between dark and light. So that's the point it's locked onto. And unfortunately for you, that means it's locked onto the microphone. The microphone in turn, so is just in front of his face. And because you've got a 1.2 aperture, it's then meant that there's no leeway. There's very little leeway. And my suggestion is if ever you're photographing live performers that you try and give yourself a little bit more leeway and an f1.2 is incredibly wide and it means that your your chance of just missing the depth this bit here the microphone's bare you know the microphone's only a couple of inches away from his face but his face is out of focus you don't have enough leeway with an aperture that wide even if you'd had this on a 3.5 or certainly a 5.6 you would have definitely got the eyes in focus as well. Um, so 
that's kind of you know that that sort of sense of I can understand you going for the wide aperture because you're trying to make sure that you have a minimal level of ISO so that the quality is there but you've still got to weigh that off about whether you get it in focus or not. So whenever you're watching, and if the fact that performers move, they rock forwards, they rock backwards, they side to side and what have you, that even though you think you've got it smack bang in focus, by the time you've gone click, they could have moved a fraction. So you have to allow yourself that little bit of leeway. So with that in mind, let's go back to this. Having said that, now we notice it if we zoomed into 100%. Once we're zoomed out to 50%, it's less noticeable or 33 percent it's even less oh certainly on your screen i would imagine you're not really noticing it at all so let's go back to what we've got here so what have i done um i've just i've whacked up the the exposure there to try and work out what if i do auto auto auto's not lightening it up very much primarily because there's a light pa there's a couple of light patches on the saxophone which are and and up here as well in the lights in the background which are saying oh we've got white we don't need to go any further so that's not enough so let's just go back we'll bring the exposure up what we're most keen to do to avoid is the idea that we blow out any highlights on his face so let me just zoom in here we're starting to lose it there so i'll maybe pull that back a little bit or maybe at this point we bring the highlights back down a little bit and we can see we just get that little bit back on his forehead there so that's 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 fine with the highlights for the moment. And then maybe you want to bring a little bit more up out of the shadows. Now, again, I'm not worrying about the background. What I'm worrying about is his T-shirt and probably the, the bit of the microphone stand as well. So we bring that bit that much out of the shadows. And that kind of gives us. Now, the other thing we want to do is because we have brightened this, is will have made it slightly more noisy. Even though you had an ISO of 50, which is great for no, normal circumstances, if we're going to add anything more, we maybe just check the opt, uh, not the optics, the detail. Um, now, we've got to be careful with the sharpening here because the, um, the microphone bit is already sharp and his eyes are slightly out. What I would say is let's just bring the luminance up a little bit and then we'll come back and do something with the eyes afterwards. We, nah, OK, maybe just not sure how much of that I want to do. Maybe we just leave that there. Maybe you can take that sharpen down a little bit because that is the microphone is just kind of overkill, I think. So having said that, we open your, your picture. Now, let's just get rid of Margaret's one there. Now, your picture, if uh, let's just open your one so we can sort of sit it side by side. Um, when I look at your black and white one here, what I immediately feel about this is that the it feels like you've kind of that the face has been over textured over now i know what you've been trying to do you've been trying to kind of capture and make sharpen it up a bit what it's also done in the process of trying to sharpen that is it has sharpened up the the microphone stand even more so that's kind of offset it a little bit uh, but what's happened as well is that the bright because you've taken the highlights down so far that his face isn't necessarily standing out enough against the background. We've got lighter patches down here, which aren't really doing you any favors. So what we've really got to do with this is start sorting out. The other, the other thing is, first of all, is the crop, right? He's facing this way. All the, most of this bit behind him is wasted space. A lot of bit of space at the top is wasted space. So the very, very first thing you can do with this is just crop in. We don't need anything more than about that much above his head and we don't need anything more than about this much behind him. What that also does, we could even maybe just bring this up a little bit. And actually what that does is it kind of puts his thumbs up hand right on that rule of on that thirds bit, which isn't a bad place to be. Um, so crop wise, I'd kind of go for this crop. Now, the next problem is it does mean that we've got a couple of little spots up here, this bright orange light, this, this blob here, which are grabbing the attention. So the first thing I would do here, I'll just use the spot remove tool, is just get rid of those and maybe that little one up there because they are grabbing the attention where we don't need them. The next problem we've got is we've got this patch over here, which is rather bright, which we don't necessarily need. So what I would do is if we take a curves, and I'm just going to take this down, darken down. And really what I'm doing is I've got an eye on this corner and I'm going to ignore the rest. Now, having taken that down to there, I will fill with black. 
So we're back to where we were. Then I'll get the paintbrush and I'll tell you what, we'll put it on something like 50% so we can do it in layers. Put the paintbrush back to white and essentially what we're going to do is just sort of gently paint that bit in here. Now again, it's quite bright down here, which we don't necessarily need. So I'll maybe just take a little bit in there, possibly a chunk in the center, possibly a little bit down here. Come back to it a couple more times around the back. And so we're really just darkening down that background, gently doing it so that we don't end up with a hard line. So it's not obvious that that's been done. Now we've done that. If you look at the difference between that and that, you can see that your man with the sax is standing out a lot better than he did. OK. So next thing we want to do is, OK, well, you're wanting to have this in black and white. So I'll select all, copy, paste and um, put this on a separate layer. And let's now go to camera raw filter and we'll play around in the black and white level. And in fact, actually, before I even get to the black and white bit, I might even just add a little bit of vignette, which you can see brings up mainly down the bottom, just darkens that little bottom corner again a little bit more, which I quite like. It's, so it's helping to draw attention back to his face. Now, at this point, we can go to um, click on the black and white and go to the black and white mixer and see where things are. Um, not a lot of not a lot in the way of red in there. Orange is kind of creating bits from behind. Don't know that that's really adding anything. Just leave them yellows. Now, the yellow is playing around with this saxophone. Do we want it brighter? Do we want it darker? We don't want it darker. Uh, we don't want it too bright. I'd probably leave that where it is. Greens, a little bit in the trees in the background. Can pretty much ignore that. Aquas, similar around with the trees. Blue, ah, now that's where most of the light is coming in here. We can see that is. So actually, we just, I would say, if we just nudge that blue up a little bit, then that kind of put, seems to put like a little bit more light coming into him from the front. Purple. Actually, then there's a little bit more, oddly enough, up on his face up here. So you grab, it, it's not always obvious which slider is going to do which bit. So it's always worth playing around. So just doing that a little bit, keep nudging it until you feel, yeah, now I've got his face a little bit brighter as well. So I now feel happier that he's, he's now standing out more than when we started that. So I'm going to click OK with that. And now I think we've got a nicer balance. Now, if you compare that to, to here, where you can see his face isn't really standing out it's kind of getting lost almost in the background and part of that as well is because I think you would probably be playing with the clarity and the sharpen tools so let's come back here we've now not got the the background's being darkened down his face is standing out much more the sax is sitting there we've got some nice lines what else can we do if we come in here this is now the point whereby we realize when we get to 100 percent nice sharp um, microphone lacking uh, sharpness in the eyes to a degree. So I'll duplicate this layer and then let's go back into camera raw filter. And we're zooming into here. And what I might do is actually do two separate ideas. One essentially for the microphone. I might just soften that down with a um, separately. But let's just see what we can do with his eyes first. Now, if we just sort of straightforwardly go for texture, it kind of, yeah, you can kind of, it's not bad, it adds a bit. Clarity, clarity, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that kind of makes it feel a little bit. I mean, if we were to go down to um, optics, where are we? Detail. Actually, tell you what, let me go back, take off that clarity so we can see what happens if we go to detail. If we just straightforwardly sharpen everything up, then what actually happens if you, looking a bit further here is we get all these kind of little artifacts and everything and actually it's not it's a it's a kind of a false sharpen so we i think we've got to be careful here where we can maybe yeah i don't really like the natural level of sharpen so this is why i'm going back here and actually i'm thinking more about just upping the texture a little bit up the clarity a little bit it's not absolutely perfect but it's certainly making it a bit sharper now the thing is having done that um, you now we, we do have the potential here of having made his face just a bit too much there so I'm just going to take that down a bit maybe bring the exposure up a bit I'm just thinking about his face I'm going to mask off everything else about his face I don't want to get the highlights too much I'm going to do a little bit of contrast yeah even something like that I think looks quite good um, 
And so now I'm going to do that. Now it has made this overall face slightly darker. But what I'm going to do is, because I don't want everything else sharpened, especially this bit here, I'm going to mask that off. And then again, with the paintbrush, and probably while I could take in everything, I don't necessarily need to take in everything. Um, let's just do his eyes, create a little bit more contrast around the eyes, and then maybe the fringe, a little bit of hair, and a bit in his beard. Let his beard become a little bit sharper like that. And then maybe his moustache and mouth, but be careful not to go onto the, the microphone stand. And then that way, we've just gone, and that's sort of brought his face a little bit more into, um, I clicked the wrong bit there. Um, Whereas if we if we start right, if we start doing it with the um, with the forehead, it, we can end up kind of creating that bit too dark. I think we don't need that. We don't need the forehead. What we need is that concentration on the eyes. Um, and then what I might do, I mean, I think I would be tempted here if I select all, copy, paste. And I'm going to now I'm just thinking about that microphone and I'm going to go to blur. I'm going to go to Gaussian or Gaussian blur. And yeah, adjust. What have we got from zero to one? If I go up to two, it starts getting too blurred. I would say probably something like one, one point five. Now, again, I don't want everything. So I mask that off and then I'm purely going to paint this back in this slightly blurrier. Um, microphone because the sharpness of that microphone is what's really contrasting with his face so I'd be tempted to just kind of come down over these over these little bits here where it's really standing out this thing these bits here are not going to be noticeable if you're just showing it online it's only going to be noticeable if you are uh, but when you come to print, if you are printing this up for the Texas State Fair, then this is where a, an ultra sharp microphone is just going to stand out against a not so sharp face. And that's going to play against you. Having done all that, let's copy that and put that onto a fresh layer. I think you can now just tidy up with a little bit of dodge and burn. And what we might want is if I go to dodge tool, I'll set the midtones. I'll have the midtones at something like about... Uh, well, let's go for eight to just see what happens. And I might just lighten up fractionally. Yep, just his eyes a little bit. So it's catching um, essentially the whites of the eyes and that's going to make them stand out a fraction more. You see that? And then with that, what I might also do is, I want, uh, maybe just do a little bit on his thumb here. His thumb is actually part of this. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of highlight. Yeah, I've got to be careful here. Just a very slight dodge. And then I'm going to do a little bit of burn as well in the shadows, which are currently sitting at 6%. And see, just very gently. And what that does, if you look at his hand, just adds a little touch to his hand, makes his hand a fraction more prominent. Um, but you need to play around with that to get that where you want. You don't, you've got to be careful about spilling over into the rest of the picture. Because his hand is out of focus, we still need it to be as, as uh, we need to get these kind of contrast bits going so that it still stands out as part of what he is doing, is gesturing towards you, the viewer. And ultimately then, I think this is what you end up with. And I think this is, the, this is as close to the kind of photo that you can hope to get with the black and white. When we come back to this, we now look at it and it just feels very overcooked in the way that you're trying to be trying to um, sharpening up his face. And it's ended up kind of darkening down. His face has got lost in the background. The, uh, and things like the saxophone and the microphone stand have just become over sharpened. Um, whereas we go back to here, that's got, I think, much more of a natural feel to it and captures that wonderful moment whereby you're there with the camera, he sees you, gives you the thumbs up. I mean, it's a photographer's dream to be acknowledged. <laughs> he's, he's gifting you that. Um, unfortunately, your wide aperture meant that you couldn't quite get the right bit in focus. But I think now, once you've got that, I think that will probably print up close to good enough. Now, then it kind of depends on how closely inspecting 
the uh, judges are. Some of them might be, oh, those eyes are not in absolute sharp focus, therefore you won't get it. Some of them might be standing far enough back to be able to take in the whole picture. So very detailed um, response to you there, but several different layers. But I hope then that that really gives you uh, a good sense of what's possible with that photo there, Robert. Right. OK, so a few more comments here. Um, oh, people saying hello to Pat. Um, uh, April says she's never been to Texas and plans to get there one day. Rosemary says, uh, despite the technical issues, still a fabulous shot. You nailed the moment. Um, uh, Meg says, I really like the diagonal of the saxophone in the photo. Yeah, I mean, it's a good shape that you've got one diagonal. You've got the, the microphone stand coming up towards his face. Good leading line. You've got that saxophone underneath creating, helping to create the shape. But we needed to lose the back part of that photo what was behind him in order to um, really kind of help to create that shape. Uh, Rosemary says the tip of adjusting color sliders in the conversion to black and white is interesting. And John Harvey also says great tip about the black and white mix of colors. Uh, Robert says these are perfect edits. I was having problems with mine. Thank you for the pointers. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you found that useful. Um, uh, April says excellent. Love it, Kim. And uh, Rosemary says great edits. That's become a great more a great image to promote at the fair. Uh, April says, um, John, hope to see some of your new picks on the platform. Enjoyed your last one. Um, you said you went out and took some new picks. Robert says, I think your edits capture the story. Susan says, you're a magician, Kim. Great edits. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'll take the praise wherever it comes from. Uh, Sandra says, great facial expression and diagonal with the sax. And Robert says, I was take it this was taken at the blue hour. Um, I walked down to the pavilion and that's why my settings weren't ready. Yeah, always the case. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Yes, you, you, I, I th but I think generally speaking, I mean, there's very few times when actually having the one point, having your aperture at 1.2 is going to benefit you completely um, because of that problem of, you know, especially if you're out and about and you're in scavenger mode, you know, you're trying to capture whatever you can, whatever might appear in front of you. You know, now if you've got a studio mode, if you're doing a still life, if you've got time to set everything up, you've got a tripod, at that point having the widest aperture you can get is maybe something that you play with. But if you're in a if you're in a position, and this is true for everybody, not just for Robert, is if you're in that point whereby you are wandering around in the hope of something interesting might grab your attention, then what you're wanting to do is have flexibility and leeway. You want so I would always suggest that you go with much more with a kind of Think 5.6, if you've got a 1.2 aperture, think go to maybe 3.5 as a minimum. I wouldn't want to drop down to 2.8 or 1.2 or something like that because there just isn't as much leeway. Um, in scavenger mode, you've just got, you, you're trying to create, it's, it's always going to be a compromise because you're never going to have exactly the right settings on you. But if you've got it close enough, then you can make the adjustments in your editing process afterwards. Right, okay, so little reminder here that if you find these podcasts useful, interesting, entertaining, then uh, you can support these with buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayres. Certainly one of the ways you can help. Another way you can, other ways you can help are, well, of course, make sure you like and subscribe. Tell your friends about it. There's, you've got to know other people who love photography who would find these podcasts absolutely uh, useful. So let them know, point them to the fact that we have 163 other episodes sitting all there, which you can just dip in and out of. Though generally speaking, I do tend to say to people, if you are going to dip into them, start at the most recent ones and work your way back. Never feel you've got to go back to episode one. On occasions, I've had to go back and take a look at episode one and I wince at the my presentation <laughs> and, you know, in fact the first 30 or 40 I think uh, it took me about that long to kind of get into my stride when you look back at them they're very slow and you there's an awful lot of panic in my eyes a lot of the time as well um, just to cheer Susan up a bit I'm looking out the window the rain has finally arrived in Castle Douglas <laughs> so you're not alone in in Kukubri with it right okay so we'll move on then to Amajit now Amajit um, sent me this photo and then he also sent me his original photo which is this one uh, and then this is his, his edited version and Amajit said I'm reaching out to seek your valuable feedback on a particular photo I recently captured I'm curious to know if the color science in this image is accurate and if the perspective of the shooting is effectively portrayed 
I was aiming for a vibrant and realistic representation of the scene and I tried to ensure that the colours conveyed the intended mood and atmosphere. However, I am aware that colour perception can be subjective. I'm eager to learn if there are any areas that need improvement or adjustments. As for perspective, I carefully considered the composition and positioning of the elements in the frame to convey a specific story and emotion. I experimented with various angles and focal lengths to capture the essence of the subject matter, but I'm curious to hear your professional opinion on how well I achieved the desired perspective. Well, yeah, okay, brilliant. So there, the nice example of let me know what kind of feedback it is you're looking for. So to what you, you've taken this photo of your friend um, or it's a self photo done on a timer and you know, I'm not totally sure there, Amajit. But what you've done here, so noticeably then in your editing that you've gone from uh, this where obviously the background, you know, the, the sky is brighter, um, uh, the, you know, the figure is, is slightly more in silhouette, but not completely. And then you, you've edited it so as to draw the um, draw out of the shadows to get a more realistic sense of skin tones and uh, what people are doing, what, what your subject is doing, um, the shirt, and even some detail in the trees in the background. And you've also then taken down the highlights. And by doing so, that's then shown that there was much more yellow of the sunset in the sky than there was, um, than the, the, the camera was able to capture. Now, for, my, for me, it does feel like slightly over heightened but then it's a difficult one to know because again a little bit depends here on where you are likely to show this photo if you are showing these photos this photo in one of those online uh, places like photo crowd or guru shots or view bug where people are looking at pictures a lot of pictures in a short space of time then actually having that slightly oversaturated yellows will work in your favor um, because it does make the picture stand out that little bit more. If you are printing this up and then you are having people to judge it like in a camera club situation where everybody's taking a little bit of time over each picture, then I think at this point it would feel just a little bit too oversaturated and I would suggest you kind of tone back slightly on uh, the intensity of the yellow. However, the yellow while is part of it, isn't necessarily, I think there are other things here which step into the way of this photo. I quite, I, I think it's fun. I like the, that sense of action that you've got in it. The, you know, your guy holding the, the sunglasses, that nice, I, I, nice the dark eyes, but the, the fact, I like that little splash of darker orange, which shows that they're sunglasses, which are making darker from the background. There's a kind of, no, don't be looking at me. And you know, yeah, there's this kind of sense of action in this, which is, is kind of fun. The next question is, is then, is are there other ways that you could improve the intensity, the story, the narrative of this photo? And there's and there's another bit about the light. So but in terms of intensifying the story, the first thing I would say is your crop. Let me open this with Photoshop and show you what I mean by that. So I'll open this and then I'll just close Robert's ones um, here. And now what's happened is your subject is right in the middle of the photo um, but he's sort of leaning over to the left of the image and what this means is we as um, as viewers I'll tell you what let me just put a, a separate thing here let me create a little pencil tool and we this curve of the back kind of creates a boundary so in essence it, the the main part of the photo is here this is what we're seeing because He's here and he's leaning to the left. And then we've got the sunlight over here. This is really where the photo happens. So actually, all this lot feels quite irrelevant. It's extra space, which is diluting, it's diluting the, the power, the strength of the story. So if we take this, now I wouldn't recommend cropping right up against him because if you were to do that, I think that then looks odd. You need to have space to the right. But if you were to sort of just come over to the right a little bit like here, so really he, you're looking at more of that kind of rule of thirds, but now we've got too much space at the top. I think we bring this down, something like this, and maybe just a touch over, but 
at this point. I almost want to have slightly more actually over on the left here. I think you end up with a crop like that and that in itself before you do anything else I think that's really helped to distill the story. It's managed to kind of intensify what it is. So you can see then that if we go from this to this we've taken your story and we've got rid of the extras or the, the the not needed bit and so therefore we've got more of the essence of your story just by cropping it like that. Another option here actually is to go for the cinematic crop. You can get away with him being more in the center if you were to go for that kind of notion that he's in the middle of a, a movie somewhere. Now if we want to get that cinematic crop we want to bring this up here as well. Now We've got to be careful we don't want to crop him at the actual elbow and we don't want to crop him at the actual joint. You either click crop there or you just come just above something like that. Now that I think and then maybe we need to come in just a fraction because actually in a cinematic shot you can kind of have him in the middle. Um, but we still want to have this letterbox ratio. In fact actually you could even bring that you could even bring that down to there where you cut off the top of his head. Bring that in a little bit something like that. And here we now have much more of this sort of sense of this looks like a film still. Um, this looks like a moment in the movie of Amaji to Amaji's friend. Um, and I think there's something quite kind of fun about that. So it's always worth thinking about your crops because your crop is going to give shape to the narrative whether it's cinematic like this or whether it's what we did earlier where we just still have it as an ordinary uh, ratioed photo but you kind of crop in and remove a bit from the top and a bit from the right hand side. So that's what I would say about the crop. Now the other bit of this which is kind of playing against you I would say is the light. Now it looks like you have either used a flash or um, a reflector to bounce back some of the light. Um, let's I mean okay let's let's pull in your original here as well. So I've just put the original on the crop. And what we can see here is that the grasses in the front are bright. They are lighter than um, your subject behind it. And when we come into here, even though you've brought up more detail out of the subject, it's actually also in the same time, it's made the, these grasses lighter as well. And the problem is, is these grasses have then, they then grab the attention because they are light and they're sitting against, you know, especially down here against the darker background. And they, they have, they are grabbing the attention and kind of getting in the way of your subject. Now, if these were silhouetted, if these were dark, it would work much better. Now, I don't know, I should have tried this earlier, but what I'm going to try here is if I go to hue saturation and I'm going to select the green and in fact what I will just do here is just to make sure I get the right green I'll click on that and then I'm going to desaturate a bit and then darken is that going to darken maybe it's not going to I don't think it's really going to do it enough um, strips that out yeah I was kind of hoping it might go darker it's not it's just um, or would it work if I did the, uh, not gradient map, um, curves, but anchor it to the one below? No, that's only, that's making everything dark. So that's not going to necessarily work. Okay, I'm not going to be able to do it off the top of my head right now. I might have to think about other ways of doing it. But in essence, what we've got to be careful here is that if you've used the flash to make sure that you are lightening him up against a back because you know, obviously with the sun behind him the chances are he would naturally go into silhouette so you've put another light source whether you're reflecting or you're using a flash to make sure that you can see he's still got light on him the problem is is that light has lit up these grasses in the front and these grasses are then taking attention away from him they're just too bright if these were silhouetted as um and you know just little black strips or, or you know and a bit more out of focus then I don't think that would be okay that still then looks like um, he's telling the reporter the, the, the 
um, sorry, the press photographer to go away. Who the, the press photographer was hiding in the grass and springing out to this film star to take a photo of him, and he said, "No, go off." And or, you know, and it's quite a fun little story. It's quite an interesting story. But I think these grasses here uh, distract because they are too bright. I think if they were darker, if the grasses were silhouetted, I think you could have got away with it. Um, so ultimately, then, Amajit, I think your key takeaway points are. Um, I think that you've, you've managed to bring out more detail out of your subject. That's really good. You've brought more colour back into the sky. That's good. I would suggest, though, if this was going into a printed competition, that you would pair that back a little bit because the, it feels slightly oversaturated. However, for some kind of online competition, it's, it's fine. It's OK. The next thing then to think about is your crop, whether you want to have more where we don't really need as much of the side or the top so you can come to there and that works fine or if you decided you wanted to go cinematic and to sort of play around with that kind of feel of is it you know does does do you want this to look like a bit like a scene from a movie in which case you know we work out our crop ratio and see how that would fit um, but finally I think ultimately you're the one thing the next thing to learn from that is really about where your light source is and the fact that you've the fact that the flash is hitting the grasses is distracting us then from the rest of it and if those were just that um, I mean they're out of focus which is good uh, but if they were that that a black and just sort of you know just little lines a bit like when we look over here you know they're just faint lines against the sky we can tell we're in the grass but they're not these ones here aren't interfering with it these ones here are going across his body and his face and so the fact that they're bright is really making a difference uh, but thank you for sending that one in Amaji. i hope that feedback um, helps gives you a sense of what's going on uh, what you could do with it uh, right okay a couple more comments here um well susan's apologizing for sending the rain my way <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it seems to have stopped again now um april says i find it creative uh pat says shame about his left hand and sandra says i like the way he's holding on to his sunglasses right okay so that brings us to conclusion i think of this um if you found this interesting useful uh, entertaining you would like to support then buymeacoffee.com forward slash kim airs i must admit i'm feeling slightly relieved that i've managed to get through this episode without um having to pack up early due to the sciatica uh though i may have to go and lie on my side for another half an hour before i do anything else um right uh next week then next week i now hmm I do have another set of photos that I'm really keen to show you, but I'm not totally sure whether I will do that next Sunday or the Sunday after yet. Um, watch this space, I suppose. At the very least, there will be space for feedback. So make sure if you would like some feedback on your photos to send them in to me. Um, you can either go to the Facebook group, which is also called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres. Leave your images there. Or you can email me, kim at kimayres.co.uk either of these send me the image if you can say if you send me the edited version but also send me the unedited version that always helps and of course let me know what your sticking point is let me know where you would like the help or if you even if you have any photography related questions that aren't actually to do with your own particular photo but there's some aspect of photography you would like to know a little bit more about you can always ask as well all right um so get those in for uh the sooner you get them in the better the easier it is for me to uh work out what kind of response i can give okay uh okay last uh, last few comments are a few people um hoping that my back gets better soon and saying thank you and cheerio to everybody so i think that that does pretty much um, bring us to at the end. Thank you ever so much to Amajit, to Margaret and to Robert for sending in the images. Thank you to all of you who've been leaving comments and saying hello and wishing me well over my back. Um, and uh, hope to see you all next week. Take care. Bye bye.